Assalamu alaikum. First of all, I just wanted to thank each and every one of you for coming here, for taking the time out, and um, you know, for this very special showing of the documentary that we're doing at Kuchhast today. Um, and I want to give a special thanks to uh, Begum Tuba Yaqub, Mrs. Hamida Naim, uh, Mrs. Shanaz Jafar, Mrs. Kesra Saeed, Mrs. Ishrat, and many others who have bought their portraits to to share with us this evening. This evening, we introduce you to Mr. Romano, which most of you probably know, who has been researching Bevan Petman for years. Out of this labor of love, the documentary came. We will be showing you an edited version of the documentary because this documentary is going to be a part of a program by the British Council later on this year, and um, which will be more elaborate and there'll be a bigger exhibition of paintings and portraits by Bevman. Uh, um, we will also, and this has been partially, uh, this has been funded by Poppy and Mouse, the documentary. Um, uh, we will also meet the Petman girls who are, um, who are actually the stars of the evening. So, Romano, I have to ask you this. Okay. Why Petman? So, it looks like we won't be starting the film straight away. No. <laughs> Why Petman? Um, well, I started, I mean, I, I first saw Petman when I was seven years old. Uh, my parents used to drag me to the Pindi Club for uh, swimming lessons. I hated the swimming. There were spiders and all sorts of horrible things in the water. So, I'd run off to the library uh, where, you know, uh, those old-fashioned Alice in Wonderland books scared me even more because the drawings in there are quite creepy. And then I saw this gentleman sitting under a tree with this beautiful black Woolsley Park next to him. And that's probably what kept the memory in my head, the shiny, beautiful car. I was a car freak before I could even walk, I suspect. And years passed and we moved around and went to Karachi and I you know, went to Italy and then it's 1989. And I'm in Lahore and at a friend's house, uh, Sherry and Azra Haq at their house. And there were these two portraits. And we got talking about it. And they said, oh, Petman, don't you remember him? Don't you know he used to live at the Pinty Club? And suddenly it all came back. And I said, oh, my God, I have seen this man. Except at that time, I didn't know who he was. And all the memory came back. And then after that, I started speaking to them, to Sherry in, in, in particular. And she said, oh, you should meet so-and-so. And so Sherry's... Uh, uh, encyclopedia of who's got what and so slowly slowly I started looking at the portraits and initially it was just looking talking to the people and and just storing it in my head then a few years later the internet came up and again I used to tell people that the dream would be to do a book or at least help someone do a book because I'm not technically qualified to do it myself and a friend said you know while the book is happening at least uh, let's do a website so the website happened and then you know, I just kept adding to the website and adding and adding. And then two and a half years ago, out of the blue, I get a phone call. And this gentleman says, my name is Taki Shaheen, and I'd like to meet you. So I met him. It was something totally unrelated to Petman at that point. It was about a film on vintage cars. And I did the interview, and as I was leaving his studio, I, kind of, I, I had figured him out by this time, that he was a person who was into research and living in the past, in, in a good way. So I, I said, well, if you're ever at a... If you're ever at a, at a loose end for another topic, why don't you look at my website? Which he did. And two days later, he called up very excited and said, my God, this is very important. We, he's ex, uh, Taki Shaheen is ex-NCA student. So he immediately made the connection. He said, we have to do a film. And I said, well, I don't have any money. And I, you know, what would the topic be about? He says, well, Batman left very little in terms of written material. There are no articles. There's no biography. There's no autobiography. So the next best thing, let's talk to the people he knew and the people he painted. So I took out my list. I started calling people. He borrowed a camera. We got into my car and we drove all over the country and we did all the interviews. And we came home and then we looked at each other and said, okay, now this was the easy part. Uh, where is, where's the money to do the editing? Because editing is not free. So we then started writing left, right and center, the usual letters to FMCGs and ABCDs and you name it. And out of 41 letters, we got one response. And it was a yes. And it was British Council and they said, 
uh, we have looked at your proposal. It's a five and a half thousand pound uh, project. We will give you 500 pounds. <laughs> so uh, again, I said gratefully accepted. So now we had 9% of our budget. And then one, a few months passed. Nothing was really happening. We had all the film in hand, about a 70 or 80 hours of film. Um, and one day I was just sitting here with Poppy. And I just started talking about the project. It actually started with Poppy talking about her grandfather. And you know, she said, you know, so much in the past. And I said, oh, by the way, you should hear about my project. And 20 minutes later, she said, I want to help. And she was as good as her word. And she gave us a, a generous, a very, the bulk of the amount, I should say. And she says, here's the check. Finish the film, just like that. And we went running. We went to the editing people. and. In a few weeks, the draft was ready. And uh, this was last year. And then Poppy has looked at it. A few other people have seen it. Some of the people here have already seen the draft. Uh, some of them, not everyone. Um, today is the first official screening. And uh, that's it. That's the story in a short of what's these two years. Across the Indus is as old as the Indus Valley civilization itself. As the subcontinent was well connected to the outside world through both sea and land routes, the influence of other cultures always made its way into the local art forms. In the second half of the 18th century, a group of British portrait painters moved to the subcontinent. In June 1769, Tilly Kettle arrived in Madras as the first professional British painter. As Tilly Kettle was the first of the professional British painters to have come and worked in India, Hal Bevan Petman was amongst the last. My green eyes, my hair falling on my shoulders. Oh, I don't know. I think it's all nice, don't you? Had had a special touch about him. Frankly, I didn't care whether uh, anybody else thought I didn't look good. I looked good. I thought he made it very pretty. And I told him, I, Hal, I, I don't think that's me. That's too pretty. Magazine, you know, it was not quite real. It was one of those things that you're projecting an image of something. But then I was reliably informed by everybody who saw it, because this is just the way you were. person who's meant to be considered beautiful doesn't think they're beautiful. So when he died, after he died, and we weren't here, when we came back to Pakistan, Beryl, his wife, came over and she said, I've got something for you, Tuba. And here was a parcel wrapped in newspaper and string, uh, which I was very puzzled what this is. I thought maybe Hal has given us a picture he's painted of some beautiful scenery or Srinagar or some place where there are mountains and things like that. And to my absolute astonishment, when I, <laughs> there was this unfinished portrait of mine. I'd completely forgotten that he'd done it and I didn't even know it had existed. We do have small memories, very small, short memories. 
because art has never been given recognition by the state they think it's only for the naughty boys and girls let's see how it goes will it be the beard or the brush hal bevan petman died in royal pindi in 1980 he came as a very young man and he died here as an old man and he's buried here so he really belonged to pakistan actually hal requested to paint me as he was going to give it to us as a wedding present and uh, because my husband had known him and we, they were very good friends and i just got married and we were living in the other half of the bungalow in the pindi club he lived in the other half so we sort of became like a family and this was hal's wedding gift to us but this is hamida begum hamida yahan pe maujood hai and she is i think the oldest person over here who has been painted by petman and we are so grateful that she has made the effort to come over here we saw you in the picture in the documentary and now we just wanted to ask you know what it feels like yes we are all very pri privileged to have mrs naeem among us she'll be 100 after 4 years uh, i'm sure she'd like to say a few words some of it may not be of relevance to the painting but it will definitely be very relevant to making her feel happy to this evening any questions you may be asking must not be related to her daughter in laws i <laughs> i'm really happy to see my i'm very happy to see my painting but still I don't know whether I put on age. No, you and you haven't aged you at haven't, all. You look the same. <laughs> yes, I used to be very pretty, beautiful, beautiful, but now I think due to age I'm not very happy to see You have My aged beautifully. You have, you have aged beautifully. You're a beautiful woman. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a very interesting pa uh, story to this painting. And Faiza is going to tell us about it. Actually, all paintings have stories behind them. And sometimes the story is more, or if not equally as important as the painting. So how did this painting happen? Um, this was a surprise by my gorgeous mother-in-law for her husband. and uh, she used to disappear three four times a week to get it done in time for his birthday and she was expecting my husband tarik at the time which is why he's claimed this painting in the first place and uh, my father law would be wondering she's dressing up putting a lot of makeup on and leaving for hours i wonder what's happening till this happened and she's right in front of my bedroom door the first thing i see when i get up and walk out of my bedroom and it's it's lovely to have her and i think it's a beautiful painting every christmas presents were sent to their house and every eid we received presents from uncle hal and auntie beryl um he was very fond of my father and he said that i have very often thought of relocating to england i will only go said if you'll come with me <laughs> um he painted all of us at various stages of our lives he's done some pastels of my brother when he was i think 4 and um uh, he's done lovely paintings of my mother it's lying here one of the paintings is here he's done a pastel also of her uh, we have um gee this one this is my mother i i think it's sometimes in the 1950s 56 or 57 there must be a date on it that one has been signed it says to my friend said if you look at it it was done on the request of my father i also have a self portrait it's in karachi i wish i had to i had it here to show it to you um 
Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Anjum Rahman and I, I'm a journalist and uh, my family has, has four generations of lawyers. Um, Mr. Basharat Kadir knows our family very well. My great-grandfather was Sir Abdul Rahman and he was the second most senior judge at partition. And um, Romano told me about the Petmans and uh, I found out that my grandfather had a very special relationship with, uh, who was a lawyer, uh, Mohammad Fazlur Rahman, had a relationship with uh, um, his brother. Petman's brother. Petman's brother. Hal's brother. Hal's brother. In fact, he was his client. But uh, he never charged him fees because he was living on his own. In fact, he was almost adopted as a member of the family. And when the, apparently, when my f grandfather went for his honeymoon to Nathya Gali, Mr. Petman was with them <laughs> on their honeymoon, uh, accompanying them as a member of the family. And uh, I, after speaking to Romano, went into my, uh, my aunt's living room. And there, behold, is a portrait of my great-grandfather painted by Mr. Petman. And uh, it was a present given by the family um, in gratitude for the cases that had been fought for them in Quetta to get their property back. So. Yes. Uh, I'm Chris Cork. I'm editorial consultant at the News, Karachi. Um, I write a, a regular weekly column, and you're going to be delighted to know that you lot are the subject of my column next Monday. So... Um, it's probably going to be a thousand word column rather than my usual 600. But I, I'd like to say a huge thanks to Romano and the, the team here for putting together what has been a, a truly outstanding hour and a bit. We all learned something today about a Pakistan that doesn't really exist anymore, except in some memories which are beginning to fade. There are fewer and fewer. There are fewer and fewer who remember. Um, and we have to treasure those that do remember. Because what they remember is worth remembering. Thank you.